Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Donna Cassicelli, and I am from the Birmingham Museum. So March is Women's History Month, and tonight I'm here to talk to you about the Prindle Sisters. Uh, these are three women who came as wives and sisters with the first wave of pioneers to Birmingham. So who were the Prindle Sisters and what might have been their roles as pioneers here in Birmingham? And I do want to take a moment to um, state that I will be using some of my own experiences here. Uh, in my early years as a historian, before coming to the Birmingham Museum, I worked at the Henry Ford. Um, I absolutely loved being a presenter at several of the homes in the village and studied greatly what everyday life was like for women from 1760 to 1885. Now, I do have to say I was so lucky to be able to go home at night and enjoy modern conveniences like hot water, a soft bed, grocery stores to buy food. But while at the village, we were tasked with maintaining the gardens and the cooking and the sewing and during the harvest with driving the oxen, which I have done, and horse teams, plowing, harvesting, and all the chores that needed to get done, regardless of whether it was women's work or men's work. Now, one of my favorite homes was the McGuffey House where we interpreted life on the Ohio frontier in the late 18 teens, the same exact time that the Prindle sisters were getting used to life here in the wilderness of Michigan. So I may not know 100% what the sisters experienced, but I do think, or at least I hope, I can understand and truly appreciate what the Prindle sisters faced in this newly opened Michigan territory. Okay. So the three sisters were Margaret, who married John West Hunter, Olive, who married John Hamilton, and Mariah, also called Sarah, who married Daniel Hunter, younger brother to John West Hunter. They were from a family with three brothers for a total of six children. Now, Michael Prindle, the father, was from an established family on the East Coast. The first Prindle family came to America in 1654 and settled in New Haven, Connecticut. By the time Michael was born in Waterbury, Connecticut, the Prindles had been in America for well over 100 years, and over 30 Prindle family members served during the Revolutionary War. Around 1789, Michael married Sarah Crowford, who was born in New York City, and they started a family. Before 19, 1799, uh, sorry, the family moved to Brookfield, New York, where John, Olive, and Mariah were born. <clears throat> Sadly, John did not survive infancy. Now, Michael Prindle ended up passing away in 1806, and I have not really been able to find much uh, about the family in between that time period and the first child born to Margaret Prindle Hunter. So sometime before 1812, Margaret met and married John West Hunter, who was born in 1792 in Cooperstown, New York, about 25 miles east of Brooksfield. And yes, that is where the Baseball Hall of Fame is located. And yes, my husband has made a pilgrimage there. Um, and yes, he made me say that. So Margaret's first child, Harriet, was born when Margaret was between 17 and 18 years of age. Uh, the Hunter family uh, was living in Manlius, New York at that time. And the eldest Prindle brother, Bethuel Prindle, was also living in Manlius. As the census of that time, only gives the head of the household and the number of people living in the household. It's kind of hard to figure out who is actually residing with the Prindle family, with the Hunter family. Um, so we cannot be sure where Olive, Mariah, and William were living, living, be it with their brother, their married sister Margaret, or a boarding somewhere else. They could have possibly been with their mother at one of the other Prindle families that are also listed in the 1810 census for Manlius. So Margaret gave birth to her second daughter, Hulda, in 1816 in Auburn, New York. By this time, the War of 1812 had come to an end, with both John West Hunter and his father, Elijah Hunter, having served during the war. <clears throat> it is from Auburn, New York, that the Hunter entourage set out for Detroit and the frontier of the Michigan Territory. Now, the sisters may have been in for a bit of a culture shock when they arrived in Detroit. Their lives previous to leaving New York may have been more of a middle-class upbringing, at least up until their father's death. 
These pictures here are of New York in 1818, showing the latest styles of dress for women in that year. The Prindle sisters were probably not dressed in haute couture fashion, in the best silks and muslin shears, but their wardrobes were probably not pioneer style either, especially what we might think of as pioneer today. They most likely had several dresses, uh, some for visiting, some for Sunday, and maybe a dress or two for a ball or a dance. For a better understanding of the early lives of the Prindle sisters, it's important to understand where their parents grew up. Michael Prindle was born in Waterbury, Connecticut, which was founded in 1677, and by the late 1700s had a population of about 5,000. Sarah Crowford, their mother, was born in New York City, and this bustling city had large buildings, the cosmopolitan flair, and followed the latest fashions from places like Paris and after the war, London. By 18 1820, the population for the city was over 123,000 people. This was a pretty big city. Now, the sisters did grow up in Brookfield, New York, which was about 90 miles west of Albany, and the population was over 4,000 people. Not a big community compared to New York City, but not the wilderness either. The father is listed as owning a house and a lot. And the value sat right in the middle of other house values at the time, about 1790, 1800. In today's figures, they fit into what we would see as slightly upper middle class with a comparable house value between four to $600,000. Now some inflation equations estimate higher about around a $1 million house. So they weren't poor either. Now, to give you a little idea of the times, here's um, a little collage of the Morris Jamel Mansion. This mansion was built in 1765 in New York City, now part of Manhattan, and George Washington actually stayed here while in the city during the Revolutionary War. The Prindle family was not so wealthy as to own something on this grand a scale, but they may have been familiar with rooms like this. Um, maybe even had a parlor for guests with a sim similar feel, similar colors. These were very popular colors at the time uh, to do your house in. Um, so this is kind of what they would have recognized. Um, and let's just say that they were not living in a home uh, with that was a one room cabin with rough hewn logs while growing up. They were used to uh, a lot nicer places. Now, Manlius was east of Syracuse in the next place we find the sister after Margaret married John West Hunter and had her first daughter. Manlius was on the Erie Canal, well, it still is, but it was on the Erie Canal and prospered due to its construction, which began in 1817. By 19, 1820, the town had a population of over 5,000, so another fairly large town. And then Auburn, the town where Margaret's second daughter was born in 1816, was small, but growing. Uh, there were 500 people in 1810 and over 2,300 in 1820. Auburn is located just west of Syracuse and east of the, and south of the Erie Canal. Uh, it had only recently been settled when the Hunter Prindle family arrived, but the hustle and bustle with the construction of the Erie Canal and the family is moving uh, westward. Uh, it was quite, quite, grow it was growing quite fast. But the family wasn't really there that long as they were in Detroit by 1818. I mentioned earlier that the sisters might have experienced just a little bit of a culture shock. Uh, when they arrived in Detroit, the population was much smaller than the, what they were accustomed to. Uh, it only had 1,400 European settlers in 1820. The writings at the time, though, did describe the area as bustling with trade and pioneers headed to the frontier. Detroit may have been small, but it had big city energy. On June 11th, 1805, Detroit was almost completely destroyed by the Great Fire. Um, but determined to rebuild, plans were drawn up by uh, Judge Augustus Woodward, and he modeled the new city after Washington, D.C., which was designed by French-American architect Pierre-Charles L'Enfant. Now, I'm not great at French, so I'm sorry if I butchered that. 
Now, this new design featured diagonal streets that radiated like the spokes of a wheel. And like I said, though Detroit was a small town, it had big city energy. Um, as for the whole of Michigan, in 1820, the population only numbered 8,896 people of European descent. And I say European descent because the census records during most of the 19th century only recorded white settlers and enslaved individuals. Now in Michigan in 1810, there were 24 enslaved individuals recorded and in 1830, 32 enslaved people were recorded. Uh, the 1820 count is not available right now. The census records did not record the indigenous populations at all as they were not viewed as citizens at this time. Now I have tried to track down the estimated population of indigenous people in Michigan specifically for the time period Unfortunately, I could not find any reliable numbers, just wildly varying okay. estimates for America as a whole, something from like 600,000 to like 12 million. So wildly, wildly unreliable. Now, before the sisters embarked on their journey to the Michigan frontier, John West Hunter and his brother Daniel Hunter set out a few months earlier. They crossed Canada by sleigh and arrived in Detroit in March of 1818. In July of that same year, the sisters traveled with John West Hunter's parents, Elijah and Hulda Hunter, several of John West Hunter's siblings, and Margaret's two daughters. The family was 10 in total, according to the accounts of the trip by Rufus Hunter. Uh, Rufus Hunter was a brother of Daniel Hunter who was part of this entourage. Now they came by the schooner, the Neptune, with about 30 other passengers headed to Detroit. In the history of Oakland County written by Durant in 1877, Rufus actually says the trip lasted 21 days. Now that seem, might seem like a long time, but Elijah and Fanny Fish, who came one year later and settled in Birmingham in 1820, were on their schooner for over two weeks as well. So these were not, quick trips. Now the Neptune was a smaller ship at about 65 tons. This is a measurement of square footage on the ship. And while the average uh, schooner on Lake Erie was about 100 tons, so this was a smaller ship. Now I did add a photograph here of another schooner called the Friendship. This was built in 1812 and registered in 1817 for Lake Erie. And this one is at 57 tons, so slightly smaller, but it's here to give you an idea of the ship that was taken by the Prindle sisters. Now the Neptune was also registered as a cargo ship. So the journey for the family was probably not a luxurious trip by any means. Quarters were likely cramped, facilities were very limited or non-existent at the time. Now on top of this cramped ship, during this time, Lake Erie was known to be very dangerous with sudden storms and choppy waters. Many schooners went down, taking all passengers with them. Even the walk in the water, the first steamboat on Lake Erie built in 1818, did not survive the terrors of the lake, going down in 1821 in a gale force storm. Now, a fun little side note. Uh, Daniel Hunter, John West Hunter's younger brother and future husband of Mariah Prindle, was a fireman on the walk in the water uh, during this ship's short life. And I also want to remind you, poor Margaret had two little girls and she was about six months pregnant in July during this trip. This was not a pleasant trip in any century, much less in 1818. So when the sisters arrived in Detroit in the summer of 1818, Margaret was about 23 and pregnant, while Olive was around 16 and Mariah was about 13 years old. We don't know why the two younger sisters followed Margaret and the Hunter family or why they did not stay with their mother back in New York. We do know that their older brother Bethuel made his way to Michigan, but not until the 1830s. Uh, he first goes to Lapeer, then spends some time here in Birmingham, but ends up in uh, Shiawassee County, Michigan, where he spent the rest of his life and he's buried today. 
The sister's other surviving brother, William, also headed west in the 1840s, but he ended up in the Chicago area. Now, Margaret gave birth to her third daughter, Sarah Ann, while here in Detroit in October of 1818 and before the family moved to Birmingham. Olive Prindle married John Hamilton, probably in the spring or summer of 1819 when she was about 17 years old. John Hamilton had also participated in the War of 1812 and had come to Detroit around 1817, uh, and he was about 29 when the two were married. <clears throat> So from the accounts found in several papers in the eight, and in the 1877 Durant book, the family stayed for a while in Detroit while the brothers John, Daniel, and Rufus, with their father Elijah, set out to build a cabin and clear the land on John West Hunter's 160-acre plot of land, which was located in what became the southeast corner of Pierce and Maple. You can see it here on the right here. Um, we're not exactly sure uh, when the families made the arduous trek to Birmingham from Detroit. The sisters most likely came by the Saginaw Trail, which was exactly that, a little footpath used by the indigenous tribes in the area. It kept to higher ground, but was still susceptible to the swamps and mud. The area was notorious for mosquitoes and wild animals and wagons got stuck frequently. The trip may take about 45 minutes today in light traffic, but the trip in 1819 was at least one day to Birmingham and another to Pontiac. And the sisters were coming with all of their belongings. And Margaret now had two daughters and an infant to contend with while during this move. Again, not the easiest thing to do even in the 21st century. The first cabin built by the Hunter family was accidentally built on Elijah Willett's land. And in 1820, problems arose, forcing the Hunter family to construct a new Another house, this time a carpenter-built frame house, finished in 1822, which, after two moves, is now located here at the Birmingham Museum site on the north side of Maple at Southfield Road. And you are welcome to come and visit it between uh, 1 and 4 Tuesdays through Saturdays. Now, the first cabin that was built by the Hunter family was accidentally built, um, of course, on Elijah's land. Um, but this dwelling um, ended up according to Rufus Hunter, uh, being occupied by William Hall and his wife, Elizabeth Hunter Hall, a daughter to Elijah Hunter. Now, they lived here until they followed Elijah and Hall to Hunter to Southfield and purchased land in Southfield, not Birmingham. John Hamilton, who of course now married to Olive Prindle, purchased land directly north of John West Hunter. So he's up here. Um, where he built a cabin on the northeast side of Woodward, which was, again, the Saginaw Trail. Um, and again, just a single file track through swamps, marshes, and old growth forests. Though they were miles away from civilization, the sisters Margaret and Olive were about 600 feet away from each other, with Mariah living uh, amongst one of her sisters. Uh, the 1820 uh, census uh, shows that it was most likely with Margaret, uh, because uh, the census under John Hamilton uh, showed only one woman, one infant, and one man. Um, and yes, I got the 600 feet from uh, Google Maps. I uh, <laughs> I uh, made sure I uh, knew exactly how far they were apart. Um, now, uh, I'm going to use photographs later uh, from the Hunter House uh, here in Birmingham. Um, the original home of Margaret Prindle Hunter. But the house you see here on the slide today um, is the Daggett House. Now, if you come to the ha Hunter House today, um, it's not exactly as it was in 1822. Today, there is plaster on the walls and there is siding on the outside of the home. Through the years, improvements were made to the house. And when it was, but when it was first completed, it was not as bright as it is today. The interior was probably not finished with plaster in all the rooms. The inner walls were probably the exposed vertical planks that now rest behind the plaster today. We also know that the original kitchen was more of a lean-to on the back of the house and that the L shape that we recognize today was probably not added on until a few years later. 
The kitchen today reflects a pre-Civil War kitchen, which functioned the same as a lean-to kitchen. So while they're not exactly in the same location, the work was done pretty much the same. So this background for the presentation is the Daggett House, as I mentioned. And the Daggett House is at Greenfield Village. Now, this house is much older and, a, and much larger than a log cabin. Uh, but as you can see, it has the vertical planks. Um, and it offers kind of a feel of what the Hunter House probably more likely resembled when it was first built in 1822. It was also one of the homes that I worked at in the village. And the food that came from that hearth that you're seeing right now Though simple and all historically accurate, was very, very good. Um, you should envy me. But uh, adjusting to the life on the frontier was probably not easy. Uh, the sisters had grown up in a very different world from where they found themselves when Olive gave birth to her first child, a daughter, Elvira, in June of 1820. <clears throat> Now the honor of first European child born in Birmingham goes to Fanny Spencer Fish, who gave birth to a daughter Fanny in February of 1820. But Elvira, as far as we can tell, was probably the second. Now Olive had to rely on the women of the area and her sisters while delivering her first child in a log cabin in the wilds of the Michigan Territory. Childbirth at this time, of course, was a woman's business. Uh, with sisters, mothers, and or a trained midwife attending um, to the mother. Now, we don't know if any of the Prindle or Hunter women were trained midwives, um, but they most likely knew the basics of delivering a baby. Uh, of course, there were also other women in the area as well, like the aforementioned Fanny Fish, who may have offered a helping hand. Um, Childbirth was also a dangerous business. About two in every 100 women died while giving birth at this time. And about a quarter of all infants died at or soon after birth. Um, and then sadly, only about 46% of children, um, well, 46% of children never even made it to their fifth birthday. So only about 54% of children ever made it past uh, their fifth birthday. Now, surprisingly, the death rate for women who gave birth in the new hospitals that were popping up in larger cities during the 19th century was about eight and a half out of every 100 births. This was usually due to sepsis, otherwise known as blood poisoning, uh, usually due to the unsanitary habits of the doctors and staff. Um, doctors didn't feel that they needed to wash their hands in between uh, procedures. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, maybe it's not so surprising that Olive was much safer in the hands of her sisters and the elder women in Birmingham. But Margaret Prindle Hunter had her fourth daughter, Amanda, less than a year later on May 15, 1821. So by the summer of 1821, the Prindle sisters were settled in Birmingham with five young children to raise. The Hunter house was not built in till 1822, so the homes were cramped, and the closest store was a day's ride away in Detroit, a day's ride in good weather and road conditions. Now, supplies could be purchased in Detroit if needed, like cloth for making clothes, tea, coffee, and such. Other things like maple sugar, furs, and wild game could be traded for with the indigenous people living in the area. Uh, but the vast amounts of food needed for the year were grown at home, and the kitchen gardens, the chickens, and the milk cows all fell under the domestic umbrella known as women's work. Clothing, too, needed to be made or mended. So there was a lot of work going on. Now, I do want to give a small caveat. Men were expected to know the basics like cooking, sewing, and mending. Uh, these were skills needed on the battlefield, the frontier, and just basically to survive. But when they were home, these tasks definitely fell to the women. And I do love to give an example of knitting. There are many illustrations from the 19th and 19th century that show men knitting, including sailors, shepherds, and soldiers. So men, get out your knitting needles. But anyway, back to our women. Women were also responsible for the raising of the children, of course, and maintaining the house in general. However, it did not end there. Um, anytime the men were off to get supplies or to engage in political activities or wars or what have you, women were also responsible for all the men's work as well. 
Now, we can't really know for certain what the Prindle sisters' lives were like on the frontier, as nothing from them exists today that we know of. There may, of course, be a diary or letters or something in a box somewhere in somebody's attic just waiting to be donated. But until then, we have to look at general experiences of women at the time to understand what their lives may have been like in early Birmingham. So how a woman scheduled her day on the frontier differed from that of a city dweller. On the frontier, women had schedules for each season, each week, and each day. And a reminder, they did it all with children, toddlers, and babies by their side. The Prindle sisters living in town probably did not have to worry too much about when to plant and when to harvest. They may have had kitchen or herb gardens, but they also had access to general stores, bakeries, and other amenities not found in the interior of the Michigan Territory in 1819. While living in New York, the sisters may also, yes, they may have had to do chores, but the family may have also had a helper, not quite a servant, more like an extra set of hands to help with the daily chores like laundry or food prep. It was not uncommon in middle-class households to hire for seasonal work as well, especially for winter food prep. This extra set of hands was not going to be found in the earliest days of Birmingham. So responsibility for maintaining the food and clothing supplies and managing the family and household fell squarely on the shoulders of the sisters. Each season brought with it its own schedule activities with food preservation at the forefront of most. In the spring, kitchen gardens needed to be planned, planted and tended. Women needed to know how much needed to be grown to feed a possibly growing family over a full year. They needed to grow extra in case of mishaps, spoilage, or weather-related catastrophes. Planning included knowing what grew best in the specific climate, when to plant, along with knowing the maturation dates for different plants. Preservation was a labor-intensive process and fresh produce spoiled quickly, so calculating and staggering harvest times helped extend that time available to preserve the bulk quantities of food needed. In summer, as produce ripened or wild berries and other fruits became available, preservation happened as needed, uh, but left plenty of time to do other things like dye wool, make candles, deep clean the house, and do general maintenance where needed. By the fall, preservation took over the schedule, along with preparing for the winter, which included chopping wood for the winter. While many people think chopping wood fell into the male sphere of work, the truth is anybody that could wield an ax chopped wood. There are many references in women's diaries of chopping wood, and it was needed every day, even during summer, to heat water, cook food, wash clothes, take baths, warm rooms, make candles, dye, wool, preserve food, and the list goes on. I can honestly say that I am extremely efficient at chopping wood and kindling, so much so that this is an activity that falls to me at our house now. Winter, of course, was still a time of industry, once the gardens are set for winter and the food is preserved, the butchering is done. Barrels of larded meats are set up and salt or smoke cured curing can be done because you need the cold weather during the process to make sure the meat doesn't spoil during the process. You can't do this in hot weather. Lard is also made for the year. Um, this is also the time for sewing up new outfits, knitting up woolen wear, spinning yarn, and mending or altering clothing for the coming year. The records do show that not every pioneer that set out to tame the wilderness succeeded. Families failed to thrive, crops refused to grow, weather destroyed entire fields without warning, uh, an illness could sweep through and decimate an entire settlement. Setting out on the frontier was a gamble and all the hard work done could easily be wiped away in moments. Now the Prindle sisters not only survived, but it looks as if their families grew and thrived as well. But back to the chores. All right. The seasonal chores overlap the weekly chores that also needed to be done. These are the chores that the Prindle sisters were probably familiar with, even if they did have a hired hand in New York. The following schedule I'm going to give is called the Victorian work schedule, but it mir mirrors very well the chores done by women for centuries. It's just that the Victorian ladies' books admonished women to do certain things on specific days for efficiency, even if it was inconvenient and not at all efficient. We don't know on which days the Prindle sisters did their chores, but the week probably broke down in a similar pattern and goes as follows, according to the Victorians. Monday was wash day. During the summer, this was done outside on a big fire. 
Whites were boiled in a pot and the rest was scrubbed in a tub of hot water. And then they all were hung out to dry. Dinner was usually a soup or Sunday leftovers cooked on the same fire. And this was an all day affair. It was a very physically exhausting chore. And just as a note, before the Victorians got all stuffy about specific days for specific chores, most women did laundry on a non-rainy day, um, even if, you know, it meant doing laundry on a Tuesday. But that's the Victorians. Um, back to the schedule. Tuesday was ironing because natural fibers just love to hold wrinkles. Um, everything was pressed, from clothing to tablecloths, linens, and even diapers. Uh, this was also a fairly taxing chore and lasted all day. This was one done also close to a fire. So as each iron was heated on a trivet uh, above hot coals uh, using varying weights for different fabrics. So this is a, probably another day that you're gonna have uh, a one pot meal. Now Wednesday was the baking day for all the bread, pastries and baked goods needed for the end of the week through Saturday. This was also a good day to make butter and do mending to stitch up any holes, rips or tears found while doing laundry. This was important because most families on the frontier had very few outfits, usually one or two work sets and a Sunday set. Baking was also an all day chore and a long one at that. The bread oven had to be started in the very early morning and sponges for breads were made the night before. This involved huge hot fires inside the brick ovens. And after the bricks were heated, all the fire and ash removed without completely scorching off your eyebrows. And this was not me, but I've seen it happen. Anyway, at night, once the baking was done, an overnight pot of beans or stew was placed to slow cook overnight for the morning. Now, I do have to say, I love the day after baking day, even it was, if it was indoor cleaning day. The slow cooked stew and fresh bread always made up for it. Um, Thursday was the day that was set aside to sweep dust, fully clean the fireplaces and take out the rugs to be beaten along with just regular tidying up. Now Friday was of course outside cleaning day as eggs and milk were seen as part of the domestic sphere, uh, which implied women's work. This was the day set aside to clean the chicken coop, clean the milk house and make sure that the outside looked neat and tidy. While harvesting and weeding in the garden was expected to be done as needed, this was also a good day to, to give extra attention to the kitchen garden. Now, Saturday was also a set aside as a bake day. This was for Sunday in the beginning of the week. It was also for preparing the Sunday dinner after church service. And at the end of the day, it was bath time. And no, fathers weren't first and babies last. Children were usually bathed first with water changes as necessary. And then the adults bathed after the children were tucked away for the night. Now, on top of the seasonal <laughs> and weekly schedule of chores, and yes, I'm getting tired just talking about it, uh, there were also da daily chores. Mornings started early, even on Sunday. Fires uh, were needed every day for cooking and other chores. Cows needed milking every day and on a schedule to prevent mastitis. Eggs needed to be gathered and animals needed to be fed. Milking was one of those chores that could be done by either men or women, though cleaning the milk and setting it up for separating to cream uh, for the butter making all fell under women's work. Breakfast was usually leftovers from the day before. If the fire was banked well the night before, breakfast was a stew of beans or stew or beans on bread or toast. Porridge or oatmeal uh, could be set overnight in, in the coals. Um, that was also served. Um, but when we think about our famous farmhouse breakfast of eggs, bacon, and hash browns, they only became popular in the, in the early 20th century. And that was due to an advertising campaign. <laughs> now I am given an account of a simple kitchen on the frontier with limited means. In New York City, with cooks preparing the food, meals were much more elaborate. So while pancakes, which were made with fun ingredients like white wine, and those are really tasty, did exist. This was probably not served by a pioneer woman who had small children, an arm's length list of things to do and no help to do it at all. So no white wine pancakes for breakfast. <clears throat> now, once all the animals and children were up, fed and clothed, well, hopefully just the children clothed, not the animals, the dinner was started. Dinner was served in the middle of the day 
with the cooking done where the fire was located. So if it's laundry day being done outside, uh, one pot meal was made there. If irony, uh, the meal would be maybe a roast inside. Uh, baking day meals were always the best. And I do, and I do love food. So I have to tell you about two wonderful dishes. So one of our favorite baking day um, dishes was a roast venison, which had soaked in red wine or small beer overnight. And it was roasted with wild onions and tuber vegetables from the garden. And then it had a lard crust placed over the top. Now that one was much loved. Uh, but the museum, the Birmingham Museum, also did a video now on YouTube called What Were They Thinking Food Edition, where Caitlin, Kyle, and I um, ate a meal that was common for this time period, and that was jugged hair. That was a very delicious way to serve up wild game with fresh herbs and wild onions, which was also slow cooked in a beer broth um, at the back of a hearth. Ugh. I could go on with food for days, but uh, I digress. And yes, now we have to add that to the chore list too under food preservation, make small beer, wine and vinegar because yes, you also made that. So after dinner was the time to relax and rest as the bulk of the work was done in the mornings when it was cooler. The afternoons, especially during the hottest days of summer were for lighter chores. And again, for setting the animals up for the night, milking the cows again, and tidying up after a full day. Supper was usually left over dinner um, and it had usually been banked at the back of the hearth to stay hot. Now this was all on top of the weekly work and the seasonal work. It was a hard day, but evenings were a time for music, reading, and perhaps even school lessons. As more people moved to Birmingham, life did get easier. In an 1838 account by the Gazetteer of the state of Michigan, Birmingham was described as, quote, a flourishing village containing a flour mill with three run of stone, sawmill, furnace, two dry goods stores, two groceries, a lawyer, and a physician. It was also mentioned that the railroad was soon to also pass through. But before that, in the early 1820s, John West Hunter and John Hamilton had the great idea to open up taverns in their homes. Now, these were more stopovers for weary travelers and not really the let's go to the tavern and tip back a few kind of tavern. But in the case of the Prindle sisters, the accounts of their husband's travels throughout the countryside in Detroit were all over the papers in the history books. So who actually ran the Hunter and Hamilton taverns that the men set up out of their respective homes? When Hamilton was running his oxen from Detroit to as far as Flint to deliver newly arrived uh, pioneers who was at the house. And when Hunter and Hamilton were up in Rochester buying sacks of seed potatoes, who was operating the home front? Just a thought. So included in all their regular work, the Prindle sisters probably had the added work of feeding and caring for travelers bound for even further destinations. Now, <clears throat> as Birmingham grew, so did the families of the Prindle sisters. Margaret, already having four daughters by 1821, Harriet, Halda, Sarah, Ann, and Amanda, had two more children, James John Hunter, born in 1828, and Mary Hunter, born in 1830. All but Mary grew to adulthood and married. Mary, unfortunately, passed away at the age of 16. Now, Olive gave birth to her first Elvira in 1820, and now, according to some sources, had nine more children. I have only been able to definitively find the following. Louisa, who was born in 1822, William born in 1824, Oliver born in 1826, Jane born in 1830, and Ellen born in 1839. Now that doesn't mean that she did not have a few infants that did not make it. They're just not recorded. Now as for Mariah, she married Daniel Hunter sometime before 1823, as her first child, Cornelia, was born in that year when Mariah was about 18 years old. She had another daughter, Emmeline, in 1826. Of the three sisters, Mariah seemed to have a bit more of an adventurous life. Through reminiscence of her daughter, Cornelia, we find out that Mariah traveled with her two daughters to Fort Dearborn around 1829 to reunite with Daniel Hunter, who had been sent there as a government-contracted blacksmith. Now, when they arrived to Fort Dearborn, which would eventually become Chicago, 
Cornelia said that there were only two buildings uh, existing at that time. Um, the fort and the, the block house, which her father, Daniel Hunter, supposedly built, or at least helped build. Uh, they lived there for a while and then traveled back to Birmingham after his contract was complete. By the time Cordelia is telling the stories, she is in her late 80s, early 90s, and it is kind of hard to tell which occurrences um, with indigenous people were at the fort or here in Birmingham. I'm going to give you a couple of those stories. Now, she does talk about a woman at Fort Dearborn being kidnapped by several warriors, and the ransom was paid by the government. As for the interactions between her mother and several indigenous people, it's hard to discern where they took place. As told by Cornelia, one day, a young indigenous man declared that he was going to ride through her house, but she grabbed an axe and flourished it, quote unquote, <laughs> and she told him, don't you dare. He then reeled his horse around and rode through the streets yelling about how brave she was. Another time, Cornelia said that her mother made a new dress for the baby of an indigenous woman, the same as she made her own daughters. Now, the women of the tribe were so very pleased that they gave her presents such as fish and feathers. As a matter of fact, she got so many feathers that she was able to have a feather bed. Uh, Cornelia also describes at the same time the beautiful handiwork of these women and how they sewed the decorations on their skirts. In a separate article, Cornelia also relates a story of her and her sister. So her sister Emmeline had red hair and the indigenous children who camped across from the schoolhouse that was situated on Ziba Swan's property stared at it so much that Emmeline would run home as fast as she could every day from school while Cornelia visited with the other children. One day, after four children visited with Cornelia at the schoolhouse, they grabbed her up and took her home and demanded a visit at the Hunter House, where they entertained all the, the indigenous uh, uh, children in their house. Now, Cornelia eventually grew up, married Mortimer Smith, and they moved into what was reported as the first brick house built here in Birmingham, where she lived the rest of her life. So you can see a picture here of Fort Dearborn and that first uh, brick house here in Birmingham. Now, after Mariah returned to Fort Dearborn, she stayed in the local area with her other two sisters. Olive Prindle Hamilton passed away in 1845 at the early age of 43. Margaret passed in 1856 at the age of 61 and Mariah is buried under the name of Sarah, and she passed in 1866, also at the age of 61. And I do want to say without these women, there would be no quote, founding fathers, unquote, a very exclusionary term that needs to be forgotten. These were whole families. They sacrificed together, they worked together, they created communities and built new lives together. Now, they are our first pioneer families who settled in Birmingham, because the area had already been home to the Three Fires Confederation for generations before. So with that, I am going to leave you with the beautiful poem carved into Olive Prindle Hamilton's headstone. Now, this poem could have been left by her husband, yes, uh, though he does move on to Flint and marries two other women. Um, but it also rings true for her sisters who live together and raise their families together and are all buried in Greenwood Cemetery. Quote, we have traveled long together, hand in hand and heart to heart, both in fair and stormy weather, and tis hard, tis hard to part. While I sigh farewell to you, answer one and all, adieu. Well, uh, that's it. I want to thank you all so much for joining me here today in the Birmingham Museum, uh, uh, talking about uh, the Prindle sisters and what they contributed to the founding, or I should say the, the settling uh, here of Birmingham. Uh, so I guess, any questions? Thank you so much, Donna. A couple came through the chat, but I'll just read to you in case those folks didn't want to ask okay. them. <laughs> Susan asked a little bit earlier in the presentation when you were talking about planting, uh, how uh, the um, they would have protected their crops from wild animals. Uh, so then. there's yeah, so you would definitely build fencing, but there's a there's a special kind of fence called a snake rail fencing. You can see it at Greenville Village. It's it's pretty unique 
in the way it's set up, it's quickly set up. It can be moved easily so uh, post holes aren't dug. It's basically creating X's and then you slide the posts through uh, like uh, vertical X's and uh, horizontal posts. Um, and these could help keep uh, some of the, the animals out of the crops until you could build real fences. Uh, usually the kitchen garden was a little more protected uh, just because that is where uh, you would grow your your food for your family. So uh, you start seeing the fencing, um, like what we think of as fencing to keep animals out uh, very early on. And then Great. I see the second one, was it common for women to marry at 17 or 18 then? Uh, it really, it's hard to say because uh, the average was about 22 to 24. Uh, so it does seem that 17 or 18 was a little bit young, but that, that, that average was more for city living. Um, and when you're, uh, kind of like being pioneers or say with the, the Prindle sisters, their father dying so young when they were all young kids and their mom having to raise the, all the children, we don't know what means she had to raise them because yes, while Michael Prindle was alive, they were doing quite well that didn't necessarily um, pass on to the to, to wife and children, especially if she had a lot of little ones to take care of. So this might've been a way, and you do see it a lot more younger women marrying when they're in those kind of circumstances. But the average was about 22 to 24. And I got those numbers from like the Henry Ford Museum when I worked there because uh, you you do see a lot of women getting married in their 20s at the time also. What other cool recipes from that time period can you share with us? Um, oh my gosh, uh, I can share a ton. If you come to the Birmingham Museum, we have uh, uh, recipe cards for... Um, uh, jumble cookies, which are a rose, uh, a damask rose flavored cookie, because of course vanilla is going to be very hard to get, but oh, those are wonderful cookies as well. So you'll have to come by to the Hunter House and uh, <laughs> grab a recipe card. Any other questions? I think you should do a food presentation <laughs> in person where you guys all bake something <laughs> oh yeah i do the cooking i love i love i love eating so i have to love cooking <laughs> fair enough when was the i'm sorry i i know the hunter house was uh one of the houses you spoke about was it moved to your location yes so okay. it was originally on the saginaw trail um, what it would be kind of like on the uh, west side, but south of Maple, west of what is now Old Woodward. Uh, then it would be moved to Brown Street, and then it was moved to uh, it was moved to Brown Street in uh, 1893, I think. Um, and then it was moved to uh, where it is today in 1970. Cool. Yeah, you got oh, it. yeah, who is the woman sitting in front of the brick house? We think because we think it is um, Cornelia uh, Hunter Smith um, because the photo is not labeled, but Cornelia gave an interview to uh, a Miss Durkee and she glued that picture with the interview at the time the interview was taken. Uh, so we we think it's actually Cornelia. We can't be 100% positive because it's not definitively labeled. So label your photographs. <laughs> um, but because of how it was presented, how it was uh, glued into the book that we have with the original interview that she took with Cornelia, we think that it was probably that one. So, and then... Uh, Leslie says, it was common to move timber framed homes like the Hunter House into the 20th century. Yeah, so uh, we actually have one house that was on all four corners of uh, Old Woodward and uh, Maple. It is no longer there, but it actually existed on all four corners at one time because it moved. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> 
So, yeah. All right, any other questions? <laughs>